that so fast that uh, you're not going to get out of it. So I thought it would be easier. It, it gets pretty hairy very quickly. My heart rate was racing, even though, even though I was in a machine. You treat it as real. It's scary. Many pilots are familiar with the 178 seconds to live scenario based upon research from the University of Illinois. The study found that 178 seconds was the average time it took for a VFR pilot to lose control of their aircraft in simulated instrument meteorological conditions. Smart Pilot wanted to test the 178 seconds to live premise, so we conducted our own experiment. 17 pilots were recruited. All had varied amounts of flight time, some into the thousands of hours, and all the volunteers had little or no instrument training. Using a Redbird simulator at Precise Pilot, each volunteer started out in low ceilings with a five mile visibility. Flying at an indicated 1500 feet, the visibility continued to lower and eventually all found themselves in instrument meteorological conditions. Well, you know, everything started off very, very well, uh, you know, I used a lot of my VFR training, was looking outside the window quite a bit, felt quite comfortable, and then as the, the you know, everything started to deteriorate, uh, you know, moved my eyes back inside and, uh, and onto the instruments to make sure that I met the safe minimum altitudes. And then it was really to see if I could, if I could fly through it, if it was something that was, that was quick to fly through. Once I realized that it wasn't, uh, you know, I started to execute a 180 where I had paid very close attention to the, to the heading going in and the back course heading all of a sudden in the turn and now with turbulence and, and making sure that I was maintaining the aircraft, those numbers became blurred in my mind. And so I actually started flying in circles before I realized that, uh, that I had missed my back course. So that would have set me up for even greater failure. I am not used to scanning the instruments. So as soon as we go into the clouds, I'm obviously uh, in trouble. Uh, you do, do the best you can. I didn't in, invert it, but virtually I was such a, a steep bank that we would have flown in the ground. I was in such a steep turn. I couldn't bring it out of that. Uh, get low. Uh, see the trees. Yeah, you want to try and uh, level out? I'm trying to. Trying to. Wow, we're going to crash here, yeah, my friend. The ground came before <laughs> the plane corrected, <laughs> which is unfortunate. The reason why instrument flying is so hazardous to non instrument rated pilots is because you have all these cues from your body. The G-forces are playing tricks on you. The idea is always rely on the instrument. This yeah, is, yeah. they are the most reliable. Just maintain level of flight with them. Do everything you can to stay out of the, the, the soup. You quickly learn to look at the instruments, not try and figure out what's ahead of you. you your body motion doesn't tell you anything when you can't see anything. And I guess eventually I didn't stand long enough. My initial thought was to climb to a safe altitude, about 3,000 feet, perhaps eight, uh, above ground, and then concentrate on figuring out where I was. Getting into uh, deep into the clouds, we're increasing in altitude, about yeah. 3,000 feet, and you're getting into cumulus, you're getting into bad conditions, and you'll have all sorts of things, wind shear, turbulence, gusty winds, you might encounter precipitation. But the higher I got, the worse the situation became, whether it was due to icing or turbulence, perhaps, or, uh, or pilot-induced, issues. So sadly my plan failed in the end. Although I didn't hit the ground, I did manage to to disassemble the airplane in flight. Without instrument training, you aren't uh, briefed upon, about icing. You aren't briefed about turbulence, convective currents, wind shear, things like that. And that's very dangerous when, when that lack of knowledge comes into play in these conditions. And VFR pilots just don't have the proficiency at you know, proper scanning techniques, uh, the maximum steepness of a turn. For example, uh, today I saw most turns away from the weather were at 30, 45 degree banks. In instrument conditions, you want to have a maximum of a rate one turn. Oh my God, that's pretty well I came to mind. <laughs> it's, uh, since I have no experience, I was watching only one instrument really, or all two, the rate of climb and the, uh, and the turn and bank, and uh, very difficult to try to look at your instruments all the time and stay out of trouble. The uh, ability to turn just it wasn't available to me. Like I couldn't do it. I just didn't know how to do it because I'd already 
been very low to the ground and uh, can't see and uh, just basically lost it. So what just <laughs> happened is, uh, yeah, if you uh, you probably lost sight of the yeah, attitude indicator. Yeah, I lost sight of everything. Yeah. So <laughs> God. sometimes you get fixated on some of the instruments and not yep. the others. Yeah, yep. maintain a proper scan um, yep. is the best thing, best thing to do in this situation. As well, reverse course and talk to someone. Maybe you can talk to Buttonville, Toronto, just to get some vectors, get some guidance. You can't see anything. You can't see traffic. And you can't see obstacles. Yeah. And you know the ground is pretty bad. Yeah. Oh but the most God. important thing is no go, pilot go, no go decisions. At yeah. This point, so never to go. Honestly, uh, after 15 hours of uh, our hood time, it seems that it, it would have been like if I had none whatsoever. I was a total beginner. That was the strategy is to you know, add one, 180 degrees to uh, a course you know, to, to get back home. But while I was turning, I wasn't controlling my rate and I was definitely not controlling my climb rate or my descent rate. So it was a bit of a disaster. Okay. Of course, as soon as the simulator starts up, you can still see some reference outside, a little tops of the trees, which is okay. But as it starts to close in, of course, now your focus has to go strictly to instrument line. And where I found is, even though I said earlier that I would not fixate on anything in particular, you do find yourself doing that. So you break away from that. By the time you start doing that, you've already gotten behind the airplane. So it was very easy to get behind the airplane. So you end up throttle control, trying to you know, keep it level. Uh, and of course, you're in the back of your head, you're trying to get your reciprocal heading to come back out of it. All at the same time, you're getting tossed around with a little bit of turbulence. Your brain's saying one thing, the instrument's saying something else. And of course, you always try to believe the instrument, but I can see where you definitely need to have a lot of uh, hood time or simulator time. Smart Pilot's volunteer candidates had an across-the-board average of 267 seconds before either impacting terrain or experiencing what would equate to an in-flight failure. What they personally experienced reinforced the point that if you're not instrument qualified and the weather looks sketchy, eliminate the risk and wait it out.